So welcome everyone. It's exciting to see folks in person. Thank you so much for being here. This is what we're calling the third season of the Purdue University Northwest series on race, racism, and anti-racism. My name is Karen Bishop Morris. I'm an associate professor of English here at PNW, and I have the pleasure of moderating uh, the Q&A for today's presentation. So just a couple of uh, housekeeping things and um, just one really important message. This series was started actually in response to the George Floyd murder. It is absolutely a grassroots effort, faculty driven, several faculty um, across campus, but mostly in the College of Humanities, Education and Social Sciences felt it was really important for us to put together a forum uh, so that we could have some open conversation about some of the racial justice issues happening in our country. And so this series is the result of that. Um, we're dedicating this series to the inaugural speaker uh, and guest of last year's series at the invitation of Professor Lee Arts, Glenn Ford, who was the executive editor of the Black Agenda Report, uh, was our first guest in the series. And unfortunately we lost Mr. Ford um, this year. So we just like to take a moment of silence to honor his, his, his activism and his presence while he was here with us. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Professor Deepa Majumdar. She's Professor of Philosophy at Purdue University Northwest. And without her vision and tireless efforts in emailing, uh, this series probably would not be sustained. So we just want to acknowledge Professor Majumdar for her efforts and her work. And even though she's not with us in person today, she is certainly present uh, on Zoom. Also a special thank you to someone who you will meet formally in just a moment, uh, Dr. Patrick Anderson, who is our speaker from Central State University. Of course, Chancellor Thomas Keon and Provost Chris Holford for funding this series. A special thank you to Rachel Pollock in the corner. Rachel. And Jamie Eggert, and obviously our stellar AV team. Sharin Allen, Josiah Tipton, Brian Benjamin, and Greg Collins, without them, this wouldn't be happening in this room, nor would it be happening in our overflow room around the corner. Thanks too to Sue Bremer from the uh, Vice Chancellor's Office of Academic Affairs, to our Interim Dean of the College of Humanities, Education and Social Sciences, Anne Gregory, to all of you, our audience members live and on Zoom, and a special shout out to my English 105 students, Nina Qureshi, Ashley Costa, and Alyssa Patricks for manning the overflow room in 327. We encourage you to listen intently, to post your questions to the chat um, during the presentation. So please don't wait until the end. You can post questions at any time. Just a quick reminder, that views and opinions expressed here today do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of PNW faculty, students, or staff. When it's time for the Q&A, we will move the microphone here to the center, and so you'll have an opportunity to step up and ask questions. With that, I'd like to introduce Professor Lee Arts. Again, he's a professor of media studies here at PNW. Professor Arts has authored 12 books, authored or edited 12 books, all addressing media practices, democracy, and social justice. He's published 70 plus Spotlight. journal articles and presented nationally and internationally at over 100 conferences. His publication, some of the titles, Hegemony in Black and White, The Public and Its Problems, Race, Class, and Media Access, Monarchs, Monsters, and Multiculturalism, Disney's yes, Menu for yes. Global Hierarchy, you get the point. Yeah. Dr. Arts continues to teach and publish on race and class representations in the news, entertainment, including media framing of race and inequality. Without further ado, please help me welcome Professor Lee Arts. I'm glad Dr. Bishop Morris had a, a note sheet because I know you're all told don't cheat, but I have a cheat sheet. <laughs> because I couldn't remember everything I needed to say about uh, our guest speaker, who is Dr. Patrick Anderson. The first thing I want to ask you all to do is put your mask over your nose. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's difficult. Even if you wear them for several days, they start to fall. Please keep it 
over your nose for the safety of everybody around you. Uh, Dr. Patrick Anderson, are we getting feedback from something? Is there somebody on Zoom that has their mic on? I like the backbeat, but I can't move that well. Um, Dr. Anderson is an assistant <laughs> of philosophy at Central State University in Ohio. He's a regular contributor to Mint Press News, and as Dr. Bishop Morris said, the Black Agenda Report. He's also the editor of Ricky Leake's Bibliography. He got his bachelor's in philosophy and history, his master's in English and philosophy at Texas A&M, and he has a PhD in both English and philosophy. He researched, writes, and teaches on the Black radical tradition and Africana philosophy and the connections between technology, ethics, and colonialism. In his eight years of teaching, he's received numerous teaching awards and awards for his conference presentations. Written many journal articles, including on Pan-Africanism, um, including on the cultural politics of the James Bond movie, Skyfall, contributed to chapters. And the reason he was invited here, I read Black Agenda Report every week. I read a three-part series that he wrote on critical race theory. And I thought it would be appropriate and the faculty that uh, put together this series thought it would be a nice way to start um, our fall series and dedicating that to Glenn Ford, who is the executive editor of Black Agenda Report. I'd highly recommend going to blackagendareport.com and looking for Dr. Patrick Anderson. And there's a three-part series on critical race theory, which is what he's talking about today. Ironically, this is a theory that's more than 50 years old, but now it has become a controversy in the United States on school boards and state legislatures and the pages of the newspapers. But it's a theory that's been around for more than 50 years. So having Dr. Anderson here, who has studied both critical race theory and uh, black radical thought, uh, we thought it would be important to let him provide a critique. And we've heard a lot of critiques, mostly from conservatives that think it holds white people guilty and you have to give up your white privilege and you should feel bad about everything that happened to you or everything that's happened in this country is somehow your fault. Dr. Anderson provides a critique of critical race theory from the black radical tradition. And he had argued that it has been gutted, gutted and neutered. So it has become a flashpoint between the Democrats and Republicans. But I'm not here to give the speech, Dr. Anderson is. So please welcome Dr. Patrick Anderson. Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to see the turnout and you know, just thank you for coming out um, to listen and uh, most importantly, ask questions, discuss, talk. You know, I'm here to share with you what I know, but I also want you to share with me what you're wondering. Um, and this is very important because, you know, if I, I can get up here and talk about anything I want to talk about, but that doesn't help you all if I'm not talking about stuff that's going to help you understand or help you act in the world or uh, grow and flourish or anything like that. So, you know, so please, we're, you know, I'm going to sort of set up for our conversation and then hopefully, you know, we can get some really good questions and have some and have some discussion. Um, thanks to uh, Professor Arts for inviting me and I'm really happy to be here as part of the series. Um, I really did look up to Glenn Ford as an activist and a writer. And so um, I'm very happy to be here as part of the series that not only he inaugurated, but that this season is dedicated to him. And I planned on dedicating my talk to him, but of course that's already been done. And so I just want to reiterate, you know, that um, I firmly agree and accept that dedication. And um, I also would like to add that um, I'd like to dedicate this talk to Charles Mills, who uh, was a very important black philosopher in the United States um, who passed away recently. He was the author of The Racial Contract, Blackness Visible, and um, you know several other really great books. He was on my dissertation committee and you know, there's a lot of divaism, so to speak, right? A lot of narcissism in the ac in uh, academia and in among activists. Um, when somebody gets famous, they take it to their head a little bit, you know, and then they're too they're too good to talk to other people. 
um, neither Glenn nor Charles was like that. Charles, you know, he was one of the most famous philosophers in the country, but when I'd be at conferences, he'd sit with me at dinner and chat and just listen to, you know, what projects do you have going on? Um, things like that. Um, and uh, Glenn Ford was the same way when I first met him. And so, you know, they were both very humble. And I think that we need uh, more intellectuals like that in the world. Um, what I'm going to talk about today in terms of critical race theory comes out of the series of articles that I did for Black Agenda Report. I was frustrated by the very superficial, um, perhaps misguided, and, you know, dare I say, nonsensical discussions of CRT that I was seeing in both the corporate media and independent media. Having studied this stuff very closely, I thought, what are these people even talking about? You know, and I put it off for like, you know, the all the controversies raging. I said, I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore it. I'm not going to write about this. And finally, I just, I couldn't anymore, you know, and so I needed to say something. And I'm glad that I did because now I'm here to have a great conversation with y'all. Um, my background in CRT is grounded in Africana philosophy, um, the anti colonial tradition of Black radical thought and also in my training in philosophy of law and sociology of law. So it's an interdisciplinary um, and, um, you know, sort of internationalist or pan-Africanist sort of perspective that I bring to the table today. And um, here I just have an outline of what I want to talk about. Got four main sections here. The first, I'm gonna introduce the realist and idealist distinction within CRT. Then I'll go into the origins of each of those. They have slightly different origins, and that's important for understanding the methodologies and the political dispositions of these two different orientations within CRT. And then finally, I'll talk about the idealist turn, the future of CRT, and sort of like where things were about 20 years ago, and, um, and you know, where, where things might go now that this question of CRT has bubbled up in um, contemporary discourse again. So that's sort of our outline here. And we'll go ahead and jump into that first section. So I have a little chart here uh, indicating some of the basic differences between idealism and realism, or we can also say that realism is a sort of philosophical materialism as well. And this is a, a well-known distinction in critical race theory and among critical race theorists. In um, the introduction to critical race theory written by Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanik, um, they actually discussed this at length. This text was quoted in so many um, you know, news articles about CRT. Oh, what are the basic principles? But this realist idealist distinction was never brought up. And the discussion of the realist and um, uh, idealist distinction that I'm going to give you today comes from Delgado's review of a later work around 2002, 2003, a later work of CRT that um, is very important. And so, um, and so I want to, you know, sort of give that background um, as well. The printer shuffled my stuff. There we go. Okay. So Delgado says, look, there's these two different distinctions. On the one hand, the idealist tradition of CRT is interested in what we might call discourse analysis. It's looking at words, language, symbols. It's interested in psychologies. It's interested in epistemologies, meaning what, is, what kind of knowledge is involved. And in analyzing race in the law, in some ways this makes a lot of sense because law is very text-based um, enterprise, a very text-based discipline. And so you have to look at the words and the way that categories are formed in the law and how they work in general. And so uh, the idealist school is largely going to offer us either linguistic or psychological solutions to racism, meaning that you can educate white people out of racism, or if we change minds, then we change structures, this sort of thing. And I put Jacques Derrida on the chart here just to gesture toward the fact that a lot of the idealist school will use post-structuralist or post-modern sorts of philosophies to engage their critiques. The realist or materialist school, on the other hand, is interested in a socioeconomic analysis. It's not necessarily going to focus on symbols, words, language, psychologies, and so on. Instead, what it's going to focus on 
our economics, social political structures, history. What are the historical patterns? This is the basis for this orientation in CRT. Not so much words and symbols, but wealth and power. And unlike the idealist school, the materialist school, the realist school want material solutions. So it's about a fundamental redistribution of power, not about educating minds or winning hearts or anything like this. And I put Du Bois on there to juxtapose with Derrida because if anybody's ever read Du Bois, and I, I hope somebody in here has read Du Bois past dark water because usually that's about as far as we get, even though all the more interesting stuff is in the last 40 years of his life, Du Bois you know, is interested in history, he's interested in sociology and economics, and he wants to understand the material conditions of society, the material conditions that Black people face, and um, ghost click in here, um, the material conditions that Black people face, and um, therefore um, looking at, you know, empirical matters, factual matters, statistics, historical patterns, and so on. So this is the basic distinction. Now, these two different schools have two different origins, and so I want to explore each of those, starting with the realist school, because in the beginning of CRT, the realists were the dominant school of thought within this intellectual tradition. Derek Bell is largely considered the founder of CRT, the father of CRT as such, but also he's one of the main realist um, CRT scholars. So he's going to be a paradigm figure, a leading figure in the realist faction of the CRT intellectual tradition. And what I have here is a picture of um, Bell's first textbook, the very first textbook on race and the law. It's considered to be the foundational text of all CRT. I've got it right here. Race, Racism, and American Law, originally published 1973. And the picture here, you know, we've got like the Zoom stuff up, but you can see the picture. And maybe for those uh, in attendance, you can hold this up. Does anybody know what this picture is? Have we seen this before? Yes. Yeah, does anybody know the names? That's okay. I mean, we know what this we know what the picture is, right? But what is the what is the salute here? What's the fist? What's it mean? Black power. Black power. Right. So why would Bell put in the very first pages of his textbook a picture of a black power salute. Because he's situated in this book in that tradition. He's saying this is a work of black power, right? This, is, this analysis is grounded in that intellectual tradition. Bell was born in 1930 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And in 1957, he completed his law degree at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He was highly active in civil rights uh, litigation during the 50s and 60s, and he worked under Robert L. Carter, who he considers to be a mentor. And Carter is very important. We won't really talk about him today, um, but if you have a question, maybe, maybe we can bring that up at the end. Um, after a brief appointment working at the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Justice Department, Bell resigned, and he worked full time for the NAACP's Legal Defense and Education Fund. And during this time, Bell worked on dozens of desegregation cases, and get it, he got firsthand experience how litigation and activism overlap during this time. In 1967, he left the NAACP and went into academia, first at University of Southern California and later at Harvard Law School. At Harvard Law, this is where Bell developed his critique of the civil rights movement, its litigation strategies, and this critique is what informs this textbook here. He included this picture of Thomas Smith and John Carlos raising black power fists in 1968 at the Olympics in the front of the book to signal his commitment to black power in the black radical tradition. During the 80s, Bell moved from university to university. He was usually protesting the refusal of law schools to hire more faculty of color, especially black women. And in 1991, he began teaching at New York University where he remained active until his death in 2011. 
Now, Bell's vision of the relationship between race and law is shaped by his litigation experience, but he also took inspiration from the black radical tradition. James Baldwin, Franz Fanon, Robert Allen, sociologist, and most importantly, Du Bois. And so for the sake of time, I just wanna focus on the Du Bois part of the inspiration on, um, on Derrick Bell. And go. This is dead. Well, I mean, I shouldn't be so dramatic. Maybe we need a new battery. <laughs> Or if you can just click, that's good too. No, if you can just click, that works. Hey, that's me. Hey, there we go. Okay, so Du Bois. We're gonna start with Du Bois in 1935. Because in these two essays, very pivotal for Du Bois, um, first, a Negro nation within the nation, and second, does the Negro need separate schools? Du Bois spent decades arguing that school integration would destroy black education. He feared that black students would forget Africa, misunderstand themselves, and eventually just come to identify themselves with Western culture and American empire. And these points are succinctly expressed in these two essays. As we can see, he says, if there's gonna be any advancement for black people in the United States, we need to separate ourselves and develop our economic and cultural um, uh, institutions. And if we integrate schools, black students will not get an education. Jumping ahead about 25 years to the end of Du Bois life. In the last few years he was alive, right? We never hear about this Du Bois. But in the last few years that he was alive, he maintained these positions. And after Brown versus Board of Education, in which the, the Supreme Court said that se uh, segregation is inherently unequal, Du Bois observed the very thing that he had so long feared. Educated middle-class black people became cold warriors, fervent capitalists and champions of US empire. For Du Bois, integration was the very means by which the United States would assimilate elite blacks and thereby obfuscate the racial and racist structures of American society. By contrast, Du Bois contained, continued his six decade commitment to Pan-Africanism and was also targeted by the US government as a subversive threat to the nation. But most importantly, Du Bois argued that segregation was eliminated by the Supreme Court, not because segregation is morally wrong, but because segregation was embarrassing the United States during the Cold War. All the Soviet Union had to do was say, oh, you think you represent freedom? Look at how you treat black people in your own country. And best bet, decolonizing countries in Asia, Middle East, Africa, and elsewhere were taking note of this. So the US government knew that America was not gonna win the hearts and minds of the darker races worldwide when they did not even afford black people human dignity at home, and Du Bois was on to this cynical scheme. So these are the texts that Derrick Bell is reading. This is where he's getting his um, inspiration. And so now I wanna talk about Derrick Bell's realism. He learned from reading Du Bois. Bell learned to ground his analysis in history and economics. He learned to look for white self-interest behind every instance of so-called racial progress. And he learned, like Du Bois, that racism in the United States was not going to disappear anytime soon, if at all. And so there's three components here to Derrick Bell's realism that we have to unpack. The first is the materialist analysis, empiricism. We don't start off thinking about, oh, you know, the ideals of America really are these, and that's what America really is. And if it's not doing that in practice, then it's just failing to live up to itself. That's not what Bell is gonna do. He's gonna say, that's why it's called a realist approach. What's actually happening in reality? So we have to use sociology, economics, history to understand, right? As Martin Delaney would have said in the 19th century, the condition of black people. Second, Bell's theory of racial fortuity. He develops this from his historical analysis. And he develops it first in 1980 in an essay called Brown versus Board of Education and the Interest Convergence Dilemma. And then later on 
he fleshes out the theory of racial fortuity more in his 2004 book, Silent Covenants, Brown v. Board of Education and the Unfulfilled Hopes for Racial Reform. And racial fortuity is like this. Interest convergence says that black people will only gain rights, protections, advancements of some kind if it's in, this, if it's in the self-interest of white people to do it in that moment. However, the principle of racial sacrifice says, and when it stops being in white people's interest to grant those privileges, they take them away. So black people get stuff when groups of white people have to negotiate. And part of that negotiation is, well, we need to give some rights to black people. But then when white people come back to the table, whether this is, you know, elite versus working class or, you know, um, Democrat versus Republican or whatever groups of white people you want to chop this up as, when they come back to the negotiating table and renegotiate that, if it's no longer in either of the party's interest to fight for black rights, then they're sacrificed. And Bell, we can talk about, you know, Bell's understanding of American history, but he says every single time you've got something like school desegregation, right, then right after that, you get an instance of racial sacrifice, right, and so on. And then finally, racial realism. Racial realism follows from racial fortuity. If Black people don't have an independent power base from which they can demand things, then they're always just waiting for white people to decide what they're going to give them. And since it's never going to be in white people's interests in general to give up racism, racist structures, then racism is never going to end. And so this leads to the permanence of racism thesis. This is what racial realism is. Racism's not going to end. Equality is not possible. Therefore, Black people in the United States need to rethink their strategies. They need a different goal. Not equality, not integration, something else. And in political terms, this means that Bell is giving up on America. And we might say, oh, why? For all the reasons that he found in his materials analysis. So for Bell, he says, racial realism requires us to acknowledge the permanence of our subordinate status. That acknowledgement enables us to avoid despair and frees us to imagine and implement racial strategies that can bring fulfillment and even triumph. So he's wondering, what does the struggle for Black survival and even thriving, what does that struggle produce in terms of new values? How can we rethink our situation such that we're not trying to gain access to something that we can never access, but instead, how can we set up an, an entirely different value paradigm and embrace that? That's what he's looking to do here. So, and this is a paper that he published in 1992. So you can see between the early 70s and the early 90s, he's got this trajectory where he's developed in these theories. So now let's take a look at the idealist tradition of CRT and get a sense of where this comes from. So in 1995, this edition, Critical Race Theory, the Key Writing, this is considered like the first real collection of critical race writings. And in this text, there's a decent balance of realist and idealist uh, material because they're quoting Derrick Bell all the way back into the 70s, other realists like Richard Delgado back into there, but then some of the other idealists that started emerging in the 80s too, trying to use some of the discourse analysis and things like that. Now, there's a few important events. The first is the alternative course at Harvard Law School, 1981. Derrick Bell had left the year before, and you had a contingent of students of color who were there going, well, Derrick Bell left, and we were kind of interested in what he was doing. And, and Harvard, rather than hiring a replacement faculty, right, for Derrick Bell, they said, well, we'll just have a small speaker series go on and, you know, and, and we'll talk about race that way. Well, the students were not happy with this, so they, they created the alternative course and they read Race, Racism, and American Law in this. Okay, so this is what they're reading in 1981. Also, during the late 70s and early 80s, you have the development of the critical legal studies movement. And the critical legal studies movement is um, largely a collection of like former new left activists become intellectuals. 
neo-Marxist post-structuralists who are coming into law schools and they're trying to challenge from sort of a leftist perspective the very conservative um, disposition of law schools at that time. They're trying to say, look, law is about power. What right? rights don't actually mean anything. What matters is like how decisions are made in courts and how power is delegated from that. And so they start having a series of conferences in the, in the 80s. And um, they have one on race in 1987, where a lot of the thinkers that would become critical race theorists once this is named, um, they show up to this conference and they start to sort of figure out, well, what's the difference between critical legal studies and critical race or what, you know, what will become critical race theory? And so that conference is a turning point. And then two years later, they have the first critical race theory conference in Madison, Wisconsin, 1989. And this is when the term critical race theory is coined. Now, let me see what that. Yes. Okay. I got a quote for you here in a second. So, and so critical race theory, right, in this tradition, they see themselves as responding to two things, the liberal civil rights tradition in the 1950s and 60s, and the emergence of critical legal studies. So that, those are the two things that they see them responding to. So like Bell, they are responding to liberal civil rights, but unlike Bell, they're responding to critical legal studies. Bell knew these people, he kind of hung around a little, but he wasn't interested in their methods, and he didn't see them as like, you know, people to have. Responding to these two things. It's not that they we're doing these two things necessarily, but that these were the things we're reacting to. In short, we intend to provoke an atmosphere in which progressive scholars of color struggle to piece together an intellectual identity and a political practice that would take the form of both, and this is important, a left intervention into race discourse, right, against the liberal civil rights tradition, and race intervention into left discourse against the CLS scholars who they thought we're not doing a very sufficient job in theorizing race and the law. Indeed, the organizers of the first CRT conference coined the term critical race theory to make it clear that our work locates itself in the intersection of critical theory and race racism in the law. Remember, this is the, this is the title of Bell's text, right? But they're not doing Du Bois. They're not doing Fanon. They're not drawing from the black radical tradition, right? The intersection of critical theory and in this, case, critical theory refers to Marxism, post-structuralism, post-modernism, these kinds of Western originating intellectual traditions, intellectual traditions that are focused on, um, you know, especially post-structuralism, post-modernism, on discourse analysis, on language, semiotic symbols, things like this. So let me just give it one example of idealist CRT. And this comes from Kimberly Crenshaw's early article, Race, Reform and Retrenchment, Transformation and Legitimation in Anti-Discrimination Law from 1988. So this is considered to be a foundational text of CRT, right, in some ways, but it's an example of idealism and I'll show you why. The first thing that I find to be very interesting about this is that it says people, and, and Crenshaw is claiming this, right? There's not a footnote, the, the, there's not an argument. This is a sentence, and then she moves on. So she's asserting this as a truism, as an axiom of the argument, so to speak. People can demand change only in ways that reflect the logic of the institutions they are challenging. Now, when I first read this, I had all sorts of cartoon question marks, right? Percolating above my head because I thought, is this true? Certainly Du Bois isn't saying, oh, I'm trying to challenge American empire. And so my argument is going to reflect the logic of those institutions. He says, y'all, we need to look at what Africa's doing. So it seems to me that this statement is just fundamentally false. But nevertheless, it's one of the basic principles that gets Crenshaw's work entirely off the ground. I would argue that this is sort of a, a theme in her work, you know, especially the stuff that she's coming out with in the late 80s through the 90s. So this is the first thing that she said, right? The second thing, and this is 
where the idealism materialism uh, distinction comes back. She says, look, there's symbolic subordination and there's material subordination. For Crenshaw, right, this is where it gets interesting. For, for Crenshaw, symbolic subordination means that the way that people understand, right? I would say white people and black people internalize anti-black racism, so to say, they, um, they perceive black people as lesser. The, the, the discourse, the way, the way that black people are, are talked about, engaged in, in the media, academia, and so on, right? Engage in this linguistic symbolic kind of subordination. Material subordination is exactly the kind of thing that Du Bois, Bell are talking about. They're like, okay, well, what about economics? Oh, black people can't build up generational wealth because it's either being stolen in slavery or it's being stolen um, you know, through race mobs and lynchings um, during segregation, or it's being um, stolen because of economic exploitation, mass incarceration, destruction of the black family, all these sorts of things, um, job discrimination, uh, police brutality, things like that. Now for a realist, a materialist, we want to start with that stuff and then think about representations, symbols, words, language. For an idealist, we do it the other way around, and that's what Crenshaw says. Symbolic subordination often created material disadvantage by reinforcing race consciousness in everything from employment to education. So for Crenshaw, symbolic subordination, that's where oppression starts, and it leads to this. This is, a, a, this is just a... a a fundamental inversion of what Du Bois and Bell are doing. Bell says no. He's even got whole chapters in his 2004 book. The title, Racism's Economic Foundation. So it's diametrically opposed understanding of what causes racism. So that's the sort of orientation that's going on here in, in, in Crenshaw's early work. So now that we've got a little bit of the you know, history of these two sorts of traditions down. Also, I will say that in race reform and retrenchment, Crenshaw's not citing Du Bois. She's got this whole passage about Derrida's post-structuralism and how this helps us disentangle and, and, and deconstruct racial, uh, racial language and symbols. So let's think about where things went from the mid nineties and, and the future of CRT. Like I said before, this book came out in 1995. There's a balance of realists and idealists roughly in it because they're looking at the historical development of critical race theory. This book is published in 2002 based on a, conference, a critical race theory conference that happened, I think the year before. And that second one, seven years later, all idealism. There's not a single essay in that whole book written by a materialist, except for the epilogue, which is like two pages long, written by Derek Bell. And he's just like, I'm happy people are talking about this stuff. That's the best he can do, right? In terms of praise for that book. And Richard Delgado, who's another realist and a founder of CRT. Earlier when I was, when I said um, I was quoting that book review, right? Way back in the early um, uh, slides, that's the book review where he goes after this book and says, this is all idealism. Right, what happened to the realist tradition? Are me and Derek the only ones? That's what Delgado you know, is asking about that collection. And so then that sets the stage for moving into the 21st century with critical race theory, right? So then over, you know, from 2002, 2003, over the next decade and a half or so, you do have a few realists trying to keep the tradition alive. I'd say Kenneth Nunn in legal studies is doing this um, you know, in his work. Um, Tommy Curry in philosophy is doing this work, um, but there's not much, there's not much, you know, uh, realist. And if you read any news articles about CRT in the last eight months, you didn't hear any of this, nothing, zero. And so it's just because realists don't have any power. And do you think that realists are going to get invited on CNN or MSNBC? And Rachel Maddow will say, so tell us how American empire is fundamentally racist and why we have to do something other than integrate into it. That's not going to happen. So they're not getting that platform. But the final point I want to make is about politics, because methodologically speaking, there are political differences between these two traditions, right? 
for realists, the historical patterns in the US suggest that racial equality won't be achieved and that survival or some other kind of being in the world needs to be the aim of activism. But for the idealists, history only matters insofar as it's showing us that America hasn't lived up to its quote unquote ideals, whatever that means. And that, and that the problem is only overcome if we change minds, if we change symbols, if we educate people. And in terms of American exceptionalism, most of the idealists just accept American exceptionalism and most of the realists fundamentally reject it. So it's not just that, oh, these are just different intellectual orientations, but what's the actual consequence here? There's very real political consequences of these. Um, and for those who might be interested, I don't have anything to do with this book, so I'm not like promoting myself or anything, but uh, Timothy Golden is edited um, this book, Racism and Resistance, Essays on Derrick Bell's Racial Realism. It's coming out in December. So, you know, I would highly recommend everybody check that out if this is the sort of thing that you're interested in. It's really one of the first um, collections like this to come out of philosophy. Um, and it's interdisciplinary. So, you know, there's essays from theology, law, and so on about Derrick Bell. Um, so with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you all for listening. Um, and of course, here's my email. So if you want to email me anything like that, you know, you say, hey, you know, what are some, I got another question, or do you have any recommended readings or anything like that? You know, feel free to get a hold of me and, and we can chat. So thank you again. I think we're in a, uh, uh, the, the crowd is sufficient that I'm going to just let you take the question. So I'm not going to call okay. on people and then repeat the question. Um, I will when Dr. Bishop Morris has a question that might be on chat, I will ask her to, uh, to uh, speak to that. Okay. But anybody that has a question or a comment, a concern, a disagreement, which I really love disagreements. Benedict um, supplications. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll we'll uh, take, the, take the mic out here. But first, you have some questions from chat, yes? Yes. So a couple of questions, and then we'll move the microphone to the center so folks okay. can step up. So question number one, can Dr. Patrick Anderson explain the thought process on Western Washington University and how they just recently created separate on-campus housing for students of color? Wouldn't that allow a form of segregation again? It seems like that's a step backward. Please respond. Yeah, great question. Um, and and uh, thank you. That's, that, this is a great example, right? A test case for, for comparing the realism and idealism uh, dispositions within CRT. Right. So idealists may, or at least those who see integration into the United States social structure as the ultimate aim of, of um, activism or, or civil rights um, uh, engagement or anything like that, they are going to see that as a step backwards because it's not going towards this professed goal of equality, integration, and so on. I don't think Derek Bell would have a problem with that, right? Separate housing for um, uh, black students on campus. He might say what that does is create space for black students to be around black students without having, you know, um, white people watching, listening, you know, prowling around. Um, and, you know, for, for Derek Bell, um, following Du Bois, this kind of segregation, self-segregation, doesn't mean, oh, you know, you have hate in your heart because you don't want to be around white people or something like that. That's not, what, that's not what's the, at issue here. What's at issue is Black people are, a, are um, an oppressed group, a subclass of the overall society, and they have no power when they're dispersed among the white population. But if they can self-segregate, like Du Bois was saying in his essays, there might be a chance that black people can build up their own cultural, economic, political, um, uh, you know, educational institutions. And so, you know, this is a very minor example, right, of, of separate housing on campus, but 
you know, it does fit this broader view that, that Du Bois and Bella are working with, um, where it's, you know, it's really about self-defense and, um, and, and, you know, protecting the community in a way. So it's a great segue to the next question. You cited Bell as stating, quote, that once it stops being in the interest of white people to grant blacks rights, those rights are sacrificed. Do you think that if leadership structures in the US become more inclusive and we have more black leaders, the sacrificing of these rights can be stopped or reduced? Okay, excellent question. So let's take this back to the 19th century for a second and think about, um, uh, an African-American philosopher, Martin Delaney. He is one of the main interlocutors of Frederick Douglass, right? Just to kind of give you a context if you've never heard of Martin Delaney's name before. And Delaney's analysis of politics in the US goes something like this. Black people are a numerical minority in the United States, which means just by a sheer count, it's not possible for them to exercise any kind of independent um, political and economic decision making, right? And he's saying this in the 1850s, right? When there's slavery, you've got um, you know free black people in the north being captured and sent, you know, and taken back into slavery and everything like that. And he's like, it's just not going to happen. And so, uh, if we fast forward, right, and we say, okay, well, what kind of political representation? Well, what percent of the population in the U.S. are black people? 12, 13 percent. And even if we say, okay, 10% of black people are going to move into political leadership positions, how do they have to do that? Through an independent political party? <laughs> Through the Democratic Party. And who's the majority coalition in the Democratic Party? Various factions of white people. So even there, right, there, there's this, the, the politicians, right, even if we wanna say something like, you know, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus really is black radical or black nationalist or something like that, which we all know is not the case. But even if it was, they still have to deal with the white people in their party. And if the white people party veto it, if Nancy Pelosi says no, what are they going to do? Right. We see how this works. So um, it's not so much about, oh, if we have equal representation. I mean, Biden has the most diverse cabinet in U.S. history. We still got the same policies. And in 20 years, we're still going to have the same policies. Right. At least that's what the Du Boisian Bell kind of analysis gives us in terms of our in terms of that historical critique. Thank you. So another question here in the chat. I realize that realist CRT scholars need to be reading Fanon and other philosophy philosophers of color. But I wonder if Marx and Spinoza viewed as materialists would integrate well with a realist approach. Are you finding this in realist critical race theory texts? Ah, that's a great question too. Um, very good, very good. So um, I'll set the Spinoza aside just for a second and focus on Marx because that's where a lot of the conversation is, right? So I would say that within Marxism, there's different kinds of ways of thinking about race and class. And within you know what we have labeled here, realist CRT, which comes out of the black radical tradition, anti-colonialism, pan-Africanism, um, you know, with Bell's intellectual debts to Du Bois, you have a different way of thinking about race and class. So for Marxists, black people are part of a proletariat. Maybe they're super exploited or something like that. Um, but fundamentally, right, it's all part of this broader laboring class. Um, for Du Bois, for Bell, they're not using this class model. They're using what's called internal colonialism or internal neocolonialism or sometimes called semi-colonial analysis, which means that black people are colonized people. And yes, there are what we would call working class black people, but they're not part of a proletariat. In a colonial situation, the white proletariat still has a lot of power. They can still bargain with the bourgeoisie about things. And usually what they're bargaining about is whether or not they're gonna get a cut of the empire, right? Like think about it like this. If we have military bases all over the world, right? We're colonizing Africa, we got drone bases everywhere and so on, right? U.S. corporations getting into um, all the um, raw materials so they can be exported and, manu and manufactured into uh, manufactured goods, right, processed. And we have that situation and we say, we want universal health care, right? Spread the wealth around a little bit. It's not end the empire, it's we want our cut. And so, um, you know, this kind of analysis, right, this anti-colonial analysis that you're getting from uh, Derek Bell's realist CRT 
conceives of class differently because it's not going to say that the white proletariat is the universal class, it's going to say that the white proletariat is just a disadvantaged subgroup within the dominant colonizer class, um, the dominant colonizer group. And, uh, and so that's a reinterpretation of the, of the working class that you won't find in Marx. You will find it in Du Bois um, and you will find it in Bell, but you won't find it in Marx. Thank you. So this next question, um, I'm going to move actually the mic to the center of the room so folks that are in person have an opportunity to participate. Yeah. But while I'm doing that, I'm going to ask if you have any thoughts on the current debate about teaching critical race theory, just generally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I do know that critical race theory is a part of uh, the curriculum and education programs across the United States. I mean, there, there's, you know, journal articles, publications, collected volumes on this sort of stuff, right? How does, can critical race theory inform um, educational theory and practice? And so teachers are informed by this and do bring those things to the classroom sometimes. Um, I don't know enough about how it's taught in education programs to know whether or not this is heavily idealist or heavily realist or what mix of the two there might be. Um, uh, I do know, uh, my, my, inc my suspicion is that it's, primarily idealist sorts of stuff that would be taught in those programs. And I don't know, maybe some of you are education majors and you can speak to this a little bit better than I could. Um, but in terms of our teachers teaching critical race theory in public schools, I don't know. I mean, they're not saying like, you know, here's what interest convergence is little Timmy in fourth grade. You know, that's like, I, that's not happening. Um, and uh, so, you know, so I don't know to the extent that it's actually being taught some of the pedagogical choices of the teachers might be influenced by CRT and it might say, well, you know, in order to help stop racism, we need to make sure that we teach people about the history of racism and this sort of like an, uh, an idealist approach that we have to educate minds right in order to eradicate racism. And so they might say, well, let's emphasize, you know, uh, slavery and segregation and stuff like this in our social studies curriculum. Um, but that's not quite the same thing as just teaching critical race theory. You know, I, I, I don't think that high schoolers are reading Bell and Crenshaw and Delgado and all these people. So but I could be wrong. I'd like to see uh, if a high schooler came up to me and said, I read Derek Bell, I'd be like, that's sweet, man. <laughs> so, yeah, for uh, people who are in person, there's a mic here. Um, or I don't know, maybe if you don't want to get up, if you raise your hand, I'd be happy to just bring you the mic. So I don't know. Some people, you know, they don't want to just be the first one to get up in the front. I, I'm not a student, but I, I just wanted to make an observation about the separation and the segregation. And it's not just the language, but it's also the material conditions. It's one thing if Washington University says black students have to live in this dorm because you can't be somewhere else. It's another thing if black students say we want a space. So there's a difference between separation and segregation. It's what Malcolm X talked about all the time. Yes. The second thing is, I think I would question Bell and, and, and the rest of the uh, critical race theory that says racism must always exist because we're a minority. History shows that's not true, right? History shows that black dock workers in the United States were absolutely essential to the replacement of apartheid in South Africa. History shows when blacks, when I was a steel worker, we had Black Workers Congress and the UAW and the, and the steel workers and they had a tremendous amount of power. So if you're the majority in Chicago, that makes a big difference. You don't have to be majority in the rural outliers of the United States. It comes down to what you keep suggesting is the question of political power and the question of economic power and the question of social power. Those things can be realized way beyond your just pure raw numbers, depending on where you are in society and what the topic is. You can also win allies for that. Um, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, those are, those are both great points. Um, um, for the, uh, notion about racism, um, uh, being permanent or, you know, um, operating on kind of interest convergence and, and racial sacrifice, um, sort of model. Um, you know, I think if Bell was here, he would want to say, it's not that black people have never influenced politics on the local, state, or national level in the United States, for sure. It's just that there's not enough of a power base there to overturn racism as such. So I think that's what he would want to say. And 
for him, this is kind of like, you know, he says, if you go back to uh, abolition and the Emancipation Proclamation and, and slavery is ended, right? Bell's, the question that Bell wants to ask is not, what was the moral reason this happened? Because for him, that's not, that would just be a cover story, right? He wants to know what were the interests of people, of white people in power such that that became an acceptable thing to them. And we could say something like, well, Abraham wanted, to, uh, Abraham Lincoln wanted to um, preserve the union. Or um, additionally, we want to industrialize the South and slavery is an impediment to that. So if we abolish slavery, now all of a sudden the Northern industrialists have a brand new place they can move factories into and reorganize the economy in a way that benefits them. Um, and then of course you get reconstruction, but what happens? The compromise of 1867. And so that's the racial sacrifice. Moving ahead to Brown v. Board. Oh, so desegregation, right? Well, we can't have segregated schools. So this is the interest convergence because again, industrialization in the South, but also the Cold War. But then what happens, you move forward about a decade from Brown v. Board. Now it's not really in white people's interest anymore. And so, because they have that racial symbol of progress, right? Notice, you ever read Brown v. Board of Education? It's the shortest Supreme Court decision you ever saw, right? You go back and read Dred Scott, it's like 90 pages. You read Brown v. Board, two pages. You know why? It's written short so that the average person could understand it when it's read over radio stations all around the world. It's a propaganda. It's designed to be read that, read that way. Um, and then, you know, so for Bell, it's this, it's this vacillation, right? It's this cyclical nature of, of, of the granting and taking away of rights. Um, and for him, this is the, you know, he's not saying that racism always existed, that there was never a time in history when uh, anti-Black racism existed. That's not what he's saying. He's just saying now that it does exist and the way that the social structure works and because people make decisions off of interests and not out of, out of morals, you can never overcome that in that context, right? So that's what he would want to say. Um, there are some uh, historical examples of black thinkers, for example, trying to organize, um, you know, black majorities for power. So after the Civil War in South Carolina, Martin Delaney actually went down there and tried to organize the freed slaves because black people, now that they were no longer slaves, were 70% of the free population in that state. And he said, we've got a majority here. We could take over South Carolina if we do it right. He didn't, that, you know, people misunderstand what he was trying to do. They thought he was conservative and that he liked white supremacists or something like that. Um, but he was actually just trying to organize the majority of black people to take over an entire state in the United States, um, which I think is pretty clever, but, um, but yeah, but I think most people misunderstand what he was trying to do there. Um, so yeah, other questions? Does anybody want to come to the mic or does anybody want the mic to come to them? You just let me know. I'll, I'll make it happen. Okay. Yeah, okay, so the one question here is about um, using critical race theory to understand uh, different kinds of racism, like environmental racism. Um, yeah, I mean, I think both the idealists and the realists can give you analyses of this that will say, look, here's how the structure works so that people of color, uh, black people, uh, marginalized communities, so on, how, um, environmental degradation actually affects them to greater extents than it will richer and or whiter populations, right? And they can give you an analysis of that. It might be slightly different in terms of uh, what the outcomes are. Like, I, would, I should also point out that not all CRT realists are racial realists in the way that Derek Bell is. I, I think Delgado, for example, sees a pessimism in Bell that he doesn't want to accept. So 
I should also clarify that there's diversity among the realists, right? They disagree about how these, you know, conclusions and stuff like that. And there's, and there's intellectual diversity among the idealists in the sense that like, they don't all come to the same conclusions, right? This distinction is more just to organize the, the tradition along methodological lines, not necessarily the, clu, clu, the conclusions they reach about um, different topics. Um, I'm not actually sure what, you know, CRT scholars have said historically or even now about environmental racism. Um, there may be some literature on that, and I think that that would be uh, something super cool to look into. Um, but uh, I'm just not familiar with those um, those um, academic publications myself. And they said there was a second question. Mm. Yeah, okay, so I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit because it's a little bit long, but basically the question is, and, and also tell me if I'm getting it right too, that the, the more intense the idealism is, the more intense the real, very real oppression can become. Okay, that's the question. And this is a great question, and I was really hoping I would get this question because I have a perfect example of this. So is anybody familiar with cultural studies? Stuart Hall, Birmingham School. So Stuart Hall in 1994, he wrote this piece. I was, I was, you know, came across it somewhere. So I can't, I don't remember the exact title of it, but if you're interested in it and email me, I'm sure I've got it on my computer, on my drive somewhere, I can, I can share it with you. So I don't remember the name of it, but Stuart Hall has this piece from 1994. And he says, look, over the last 20 years, right from the seventies to the nineties, Conditions in the community have gotten kind of bad. There's been an economic downturn, loss of jobs, high unemployment, housing issues, and of course, the rise of mass incarceration and police brutality in its modern form. However, however, what we do see are increasingly positive representations of blacks and other people of color on TV, in the movies, in the magazines, and this is some kind of progress that we should at least be proud about. And I read this, I remember the first time reading this and going like, yo, you missed the point, man, right? The reason that we're getting increasingly positive images is to disguise the material reality, right? The symbolic stuff actually diverts our attention away from what's really going on in the community, the sociological, economic, historical conditions, material conditions, and makes us look and go, ah, well, isn't it nice that the Cosby show is on? I know it's way different saying Cosby show these days, but you know, <laughs> but like, you know, I mean, think, you know, think 80s, 90s, right? Like, isn't it great that we have the Huxtables, you know, positive representations, even though the majority of the, of the, the community is suffering even more, right? And this is what Derek Velho's point is. He's like, when you look at the statistics, we haven't made any progress. Things have changed, but still really bad. And, um, and so I think that, yes, in very intense idealism does, I, I would agree with Bell on this point. I, if I think if I'm right about Bell and this is his point, I fundamentally agree with him. And if it's not his point, well, then it is my point and I'm sorry for attributing it to Bell. But yeah, uh, the more intense the idealism, the less attuned we are to the material realities. And, you know, and I have, I have no problem with having good ideals, right? I think we should have them. Right. The, the debate is what, what are the ideals and where do they come from and all that sort of stuff. But the first thing we got to do is say, OK, what's really going on in the world? Right. What, what is history showing us? What's the patterns here? And then think about the ideals. So we need to be able to separate right, our descriptive accounts from our normative ambitions in order to be clear about both. And I think Bell would agree with me on that. I, I could be wrong, but I think he would agree with me on that. And um, and that's what I and that's what I have to say about that. To quote the great Forrest Gump. Right. Yeah. So first of all, just another round of applause. I know we can do better than that. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. I mean, for really breaking down critical race theory. This is such a difficult conversation to have, but with it being so ubiquitous in the media, um, I think, you know, the timing is, is certainly appropriate. Thank you, Dr. Arts, for suggesting this kickoff. Certainly appropriate, given the connection to, to Glenn Ford. Thank you all of you for attending in person and on Zoom and Facebook Live. I'd just like to announce the very next session in the series, Wednesday, October 20th, again, 12.30 to 2 p.m., we'll be um, having another hybrid event. So here um, in uh, SUL 150F and also again on Zoom, synchronous. Wednesday, October 20th, 12.30 to 2 p.m., our host will be Dr. Leveda Taylor. This is her book launch, and she's actually titled, uh, the title of the book is Implications of Race and Racism in Student Evaluations of Teaching, The Hate You Give. And so Dr. Taylor will be accompanied by contributors to her edited collection, and so we're really excited about having that conversation. Thank you again one and all for attending. And this concludes the first se uh, session in our series on race, racism, and anti-racism. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.